This video is brought to you by KEH, the re-commerce camera company. Not only is KEH the oldest and biggest at what they do, buying and selling exclusively used camera gear of all sorts since 1979, but they do it well with integrity and both a 180-day warranty and 21-day return policy, free shipping on transactions over 49 bucks. Which is why, because they make it as futz-free a process as possible, they are our go-to whenever we are looking to fund new purchases by selling our own gear or buying that special used piece of kit properly graded and checked when we want to go quirky or old school. Check them out by clicking on the links in the description below and get 5% off when you buy using the discount code HUSHOP, a 5% bonus when you sell using the discount code HUBONUS. That still sounds strange to me. In any case, please do show them some love and thank you, KEH, for making this episode of Budget Gourmet possible. What is a compact camera? For our purposes, it's basically the kind of camera, more than any other, gutted by smartphones. I'm talking about truly pants-pocketable cameras with smaller than APS-C sensors, resolution of 20 megapixels or less, always with an integrated collapsible zoom lens. Lightweight, too what we used to call point-and-shoots. Some of them have EVFs, some of them don't. Some have modest built-in neutral density filters, some don't. Some of them have crazy long zooms. I've seen up to 40x on a Canon power shot something or other, but we're going to concentrate on cameras that have full-frame field-of-view equivalents anywhere within the range of 24 to 200 millimeters. Why? If you're asking about the self-imposed lens constraint, it's because that's where most of us do most of our shooting. It's easier to achieve a higher image quality across a 3 to 5x zoom, even a 10x zoom, than 40x. A 24 to 70 zoom range, never mind 24 to 105, let alone 24 to 200, is usefully longer than what most smartphones can do even today. And the latest 1-inch sensors are surprisingly capable, meaning we can crop in a bit more than we used to and use higher ISOs rather than relying on glass. But why compact cameras? Well, because they're real cameras. That's their only job, to be cameras. Mostly stills cameras. Not a game controller, not a FaceTime phone, not a TikTok, Netflix, or YouTube player. Not a mini-me, Ari Alexa, LF Mini. The big question is, in an era of multi-lens, multi-sensor smartphones with powerful processors that sometimes do exceed that focal range and or offer computational imaging, which sometimes can blow away point and shoots for things like exposure and dynamic range on the one hand, and either big interchangeable lens 40 to 61 megapixel full frame cameras or much smaller 24 megapixel full frame or APS-C cameras on the other. Why bother? Glad you asked. Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brownstone for Three Blind Men and an Elephant. Welcome to episode two in our new series I'm calling Budget Gourmet. I've created Budget Gourmet for those of us with champagne tastes and beer budgets. In an era of rapidly escalating camera prices, a post-peak camera demand world of even smaller numbers of cameras sold. Horrifyingly smaller numbers. Which is why... Camera prices are rising so quickly at a time when we can least afford it because camera manufacturers have to make up for such an extraordinary market contraction somehow. But as I've said before, what's best for manufacturers may not always be what's best for us. And today I want to suggest to you that for some of us, compact digital cameras, the very segment decimated by smartphones, are all that we need, even more than we need. So. Let's get into it. We begin by asking ourselves not how many megapixels do we want, but how many megapixels do we actually need? And in order to answer that question, we need to ask these questions. One, what kind of images precisely are we shooting? Two, at what distances? At what time of day? At what ISO? Three, how big do we intend our images to be? Four, on what media? Five, viewed from what distance, six, by whom, and seven, do we intend to crop the crap out of images before we show them? Because, really, 
if most of the images you actually look at or ask others to look at are shot during the day and or with flash, do not require a significant crop, and are going to be viewed on an app, on your phone, like Instagram, well, at least until Instagram decided it didn't want to be a photo sharing app anymore, or printed it 8x10 or smaller. I mean, be honest, how many photos do you have hanging on your walls? Four. Four megapixels will do, seriously. Like, say, this shot on a Canon G3. But if four megapixels is so low that it's simply impossible to wrap your head around it, even when I show you this bad boy, uh, my OG Canon EOS 1D, which I captured the image of the first 9-11 Memorial Light Show in 2002. How about we set the floor at 10 megapixels? Yeah, let's do that. 10 megapixels. 8x10 prints are no problem, but they were no problem for 4 megapixels either. But back to 10, I created images like this, for example, with my 10.2 megapixel Leica M8. But back in the day, I'm talking about the early 2000 aughts and into the early teens, my M8 wasn't the only 10 megapixel camera with which I shot. You didn't need to have a Leica to get great imagery. I shot with a pile of compact cameras like this one, Canon's 10 megapixel S90, which came out in 2009, capable of images like this. Like the 4 megapixel G3, these cameras sported sensors smaller than today's currently in vogue 1 inch backside illuminated, I just love how that rolls off the tongue, 24 frames per second, 20 megapixel hybrid phase detect mini monsters. But even then, they were so much better than smartphones. Of course, you have to remember, the first iPhone came out in 2007 with a 2 megapixel camera. A year later, when Apple launched the 3G, it was still two megapixels. Apple bumped the iPhone's resolution to all of three megapixels when it launched the 3GS in 2009, then bumped it again to five megapixels when they introduced the iPhone 4 in 2010. A lot has happened since then. Yes, there is a reason why 2008 was the year global camera demand peaked and then cratered to today's 15 million or so, and that reason is indeed predominantly the smartphone. We simply can't ignore the advances in smartphones. The 12 megapixel computationally enhanced iPhone 13, coming anytime soon, is supposed to have simulated bokeh in video for f sake. The Samsung Galaxy S20 Ultra touts a 108 megapixel sensor and a digital 100x zoom. Let's not quibble over definitions or image quality at the long end, you get the point. And Sony's Xperia 1 Mark III offers a legitimate optical, not digital, full-frame equivalent field of view at the long end of 105 millimeters, just about twice that of today's current iPhone. I will not try to disabuse you of the notion, however, that a dedicated larger sensor interchangeable lens camera combination like, like this, Fujifilm's 24 megapixel APS-C X-T4 with their 16 to 55 2.8 red badge zoom, one of my favorite camera combinations of all time, stands head and shoulders above the best smartphones in the hands of someone who uses it to its fullest potential under the most challenging circumstances. Nor will I attempt to convince you that this bad boy, my 47 megapixel Leica SL2 with my Apo Sumicron isn't a joy, isn't a talisman, or doesn't give me tremendous latitude in cropping or printing I believe the technical term is Mongo, because it is, and it does, but it is heavy and big and expensive, which in the end 
leads me to my overarching point. If you can give yourself the room to step away from the reach and frequency bludgeoning of marketing messages screaming why you need the latest and greatest, I am not immune. If you can acknowledge and be comfortable with the reality that for your particular use cases, you don't need what these big, heavier, more capable, yes, absolutely, and more expensive, dedicated cameras can give you. Yet, you do want a dedicated camera shooting experience and do want to travel with a camera that is super light, super small, and super unobtrusive that will give you more reach than most smartphones and higher image quality to boot under ordinary conditions, all while availing yourself of the extraordinary advantages offered by digital workflow at a price that might shock you because it's so low, well, you can save a pile of money and wear and tear on your joints with the very kind of cameras I've just mentioned. That is to say, the compact cameras I've just mentioned. You could, for example, pick up a used but clean copy of Canon's now 9-year-old 12-megapixel G15 with a full-frame equivalent field of view of a 28 to 140 with an actual f1.8 to 2.8 variable maximum aperture for under 250 bucks. Just don't think of it as more than a stills camera, nor as a stills camera with usable ISO much beyond 100. Think $400 for a clean used copy of Sony's 6-year-old 20-megapixel 1-inch RX104 with full-frame equivalent field of view of 24 to 70 millimeters with a relatively fast variable aperture as well of 1.8 to 2.8, a camera I owned capable of images like this shot at ISO 2000. The size and performance per ounce of that camera were compelling, and the small Papa BVF was enough to get me past my own no EVF, no purchase mindset. Interested in something of a more recent vintage? I really like Panasonic's more photography centric, here we go, three year old but still current, 17 megapixel, micro four thirds sensor equipped LX100 Mark II. You can pick up a clean copy used for about 600 bucks. It comes with an integrated full-frame equivalent field of view of 24 to 75, about the same as the RX100 Mark IV, with an identical, or close to identical, f1.7 to 2.8 variable maximum aperture. It's got a real shutter speed dial on top, and OMG actual aperture ring on the lens, a little more heft, a little more room for my fingers, a marginally better EVF than the RX100 series. I love the feel of this little guy. But you may want to do it all, stills and video, and while you're at it, get much longer reach. You can buy Sony's RX100 Mark VII new with a full frame equivalent 24 to 200 field of view. Latest BSI sensor with eye tracking AF, animal AF, flip over screen, mic port, crazy frame rates, and more for 1300 bucks. But you can also save yourself a couple of hundred bucks by buying, you guessed it, used with a warranty and a return policy and free shipping. Of course, new or used, you are making trade-offs compared to smartphones or the bigger boys. Compared to smartphones with simulated bokeh, for example, if you decide that the simulation is good enough for you, you will likely find that you cannot quite duplicate the same kind of shallow depth of field so useful for portraits with compact zoom cameras. It will be marginally easier with the LX100 II because of its micro four-thirds sensor and faster variable aperture, but the RX100 models compensate somewhat with either a narrower field of view in the case of the Mark 7 and the Mark 6, actually, or on the Mark 4 and the Mark 5, I think it is, at least matching the LX100II's faster maximum aperture. The Lumix's maximum aperture of f2.8 at its long end, the full-frame equivalent field of view of, as I said earlier, 75 millimeters, will give you the full-frame equivalent depth of field of an f5.6. Still, at three feet, that's a nice size for a headshot, right? The full-frame equivalent of f5.6 will give you 1.8 inches of maneuvering room, that's all. This is enough to have one eye in focus, one knot, if you're subject to, say, at a 45-degree angle to the sensor plane. Though I think, more importantly, 
It guarantees eyes and eyebrows, nose and lips will all be in focus head on if your nose is not too big, which is a good thing. Of course, if you want shallow, this is nothing compared to the depth of field available from a full frame 85, say, at f1.4 for the same object size in frame, which would be at a distance of three feet, five inches, at which point the depth of field is just four tenths of an inch which honestly, too often, is too shallow even head-on. It can't cover the distance from the tip of my nose to the pupil of my eye. The RX-107's maximum aperture of f4.5 at its long end, the full-frame equivalent field of view of 200 millimeters, will give you the full-frame equivalent depth of field of f12. Not light value, mind you, just depth of field. At 8 feet, again, same object size, that'll give you about 3.8 inches in focus which is actually quite nice in real life, giving you a crisp image from tip of nose to the ears with fall off from there. The RX100 Mark IV splits the baby. It offsets its shorter top end of 70 millimeters, full frame equivalent field of view, with a wider maximum aperture, but even at f2.8, that's the full frame equivalent depth of field of f7.5. At, once again, same object size, that'll net you a depth of field of 2.3 inches. You will also see aesthetic differences, most notably perspective distortion, a function of distance from the subject. Then there's low light performance and dynamic range. With sensors this small, compact cameras can't match the performance of full frame, APS-C, or even micro four-thirds sensors. And without the multi-lens sensor cameras, processing power, and computational imaging algorithms of the latest smartphones, compact cameras can't match the dynamic range of those smartphones either. Finally, there's the user experience of these compact cameras versus larger, more traditional cameras. There is such a thing as buttons too small or cramped, rear screens not bright enough, EVFs not big enough, nor high resolution enough, absurd menus, blah 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 But some perspective, please. Eisenstadt captured his most famous image of all, VJ Day, with a camera like this, a Leica 3A with a Vio accessory finder. I have to tell you, the annoying little pop-up EVF of the RX100 Mark IV is an absolute dream by comparison. Let me wrap it up this way. Just over a century ago, the camera of choice for consumers was the medium format Kodak Brownie, while the camera of choice for professional photographers was the sheet film 4x5, and then there were other formats, Graflex Speed Graphic, something actually not much different from this 4x5-inch view camera from Intrepid. But in 1925, Ernst Leitz introduced the Leica camera developed by Oscar Barnack, something, again, not dissimilar from my Leica 3A, and in so doing, popularized the dramatically smaller 35 millimeter cameras, cameras that in theory offered inferior image quality. It has always been thus, I think. That is, the pursuit of smaller, lighter, and faster at the theoretical expense. I mean, it could be quite actual, but the value of superior image quality. And it is no different today because most of the time we experts overestimate how much quality is sufficient for most everyone else. We forget our Edward Demings. Now, the legendary photographer Elliot Erwitt disagrees with me, but okay, reasonable people can disagree. I still believe that if Henri Cartier-Bresson were a 20-something today, he'd be shooting with an iPhone. Okay, maybe an Android. In any case, I suspect that in the not-too-distant future, the marriage of smartphones, processing power, artificial intelligence, algorithms, user experience, and connectivity with dedicated cameras, physical controls, and singular focus on image capture will make today's high-end full-frame cameras tomorrow's sheet film or medium format camera. Curiosities. Until then, for many more of us than we might suppose, the ideal camera, at the most beautiful point in the price-performance curve where value is more important than ever, will be neither smartphone nor full-frame, but maybe just maybe, a couple of years old used compact camera. Though, personally speaking, I'm used to being a statistical outlier. This video was brought to you by KEH. Check them out by clicking on the links in the description below and get 5% off when you buy using the discount code HUSHOP, a 5% bonus when you sell using the discount code HUBONUS. I have got to get them to change that discount code.
If you like what you've seen here today, please give a thumbs up, subscribe, join the conversation below because this is an incredible audience. If you'd like a copy of our Streets of New York, the book, head over to www.3bmep.com slash books. If you'd like to schedule a one-on-one -on -one video session with me for a portfolio review, explore or hone your artistic voice, select gear and more, sign up at www.3bmep.com slash booking. Finally, consider supporting our work by using our no-cost to you affiliate links down below. Picking up some official three blind men and an elephant swag at 3bmep.threadless.com. Sending coffee money via PayPal or best of all, join us as a patron over at Patreon. However you choose to support us, as always, we thank you for it.